Casey Spencer Bay camps. The coyote killer. What? Coyote, the coyote, coyote killer. killer. Yeah, absolutely. He's he was a hero to Gene Letourneau. Yes, he is. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I have another story about Gene, because Gene's from Waterloo, and I was originally from Waterloo. And Gene didn't have a very high opinion of biologists. But he always wrote highly of me because I was more popular. And in his call, he would always say, well, I like biologists statewide, but Ron Jones of, of Waterville. Yeah. And the guys in Greenville were just screaming at me. He's like, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you got going with Gene? That he's so kind to you because he did not like. But yeah, so Casey, Casey was, he had this the chuck wagon for the Chamber of Commerce to make money because this we're talking 200 people, 250 people there, mm. just moose watchers. You know, come see the dead moose. I mean, it was it was. In a lot of ways, it was bizarre, but, you know, out of the job. So, Casey's, one day, he's selling food. At the truck. You could get, you know, hot dogs and chips and coffee and donuts. And one day, he had a sign up that said, Caribou Stew and Crackers, two fifty. Well, uh, Glenn Perkins, does that ring a bell? He was the undercover agent for the... But well, Casey was so popular with the people in the office, the wardens, he had, and, and the violence, because he was he was really a lot of fun. So Glenn comes in. To, this is Glenn grabs me in the hangar. And Moose are coming. He says, "Well, you better come with me." So I go with him. He says, "Look at his blackboard outside in the menu. Special caribou stew, crackers, two fifty. And Glenn says, you, you know what that means? I said, yeah, you can't sell game meat. It promotes, it promotes you know, yeah. illegal hunting. So yeah. he says, Casey, um, you got to step outside with me. So he sits to the customer and he says, I'll get you back. He comes up. Glenn says, look at the sign. He says, what's the matter? He says, read it. He says, am I charging too much? Glenn <laughs> <laughs> says, no, that's not the issue. The issue is your sound. Terrible moves. You can't be sound. Terrible moves me. So this is a typical Casey. So he's got a shirt, long sleeve shirt. He rolls it down, and he uses it as a racer. And he puts down caribou stew free when you buy the crackers. Glenn <laughs> <laughs> just threw up his hand. So Casey, we can do it today, but tomorrow, no caribou stew free. Or he says, well, he says I shot two caribou in Labrador, and we're trying to raise money for the girls basketball team at Greenville High School and I thought I'd get rid of some of those caribou meat. So now you can't you can't you can't, you can't be selling. But Casey was he was a classic. So he's in the book. There's a there's a story about Casey in the book. Um, I can remember these dark winter days, cold, oh jeez, on the south end of Moosehead Lake. The wind would howl and it was so cold. But Casey would come in, because it was kind of in between seasons for him. He ran Casey's sporting camps in the summertime, um, and trapped and shot coyotes in the winter. But he would come in and uh, just brighten up the day. You know, we, we all got a big chuckle out of Casey. He's just very, very kind of a nervous, energetic guy. Like, like he had like like a shrew. I mean, he was just he he's fun and funny to be around. So I I think I got started. <coughs> writing this book, um, I, I was telling Lindsay, I, I had no intention of writing a book. But when I got to Greenville in 88, I was born in, in 1952 in Oakland, in Waterloo, And my mother's parents had a farm, a dairy farm, in Mercer, which is between Orange Rock and Farmington on the same side. So as a kid, and I just love spending time on my grandparents' dairy farm. They were barely able to make a living. They only had they had no electricity when I was a kid. So he milked at most my grandfather, probably sixteen or eighteen Jersey and Guernsey cows. Holstein was a swear word in the house because they want they, she wanted the high buttermilk because she made butter and so. So um, I got my introduction to wildlife on that front. And so I get to Greenville in, in 88, and, uh, and it was just, it was a dream come true for me. I just, I just, I 
loved the job. And uh, that was going to go with the story. Okay. <laughs> this happens a lot. Oh, Everett Parker. He was the owner of the Moosehead. Come on in. Oh, you're, you're working. <laughs> Everett Parker was the owner of the Moosehead Messenger, a weekly paper. I can't remember his wife, but they called him. I don't, I don't, does he still own it? Uh, no. He sold it. Doesn't exist anymore. That didn't, didn't even exist. Right. <laughs> it was a weekly paper. And Everett approached me. I hadn't been there for more than a month or so. And Everett approached me and said, would you write a column for a music messenger? <coughs> I said, well, I could try. I said, yeah, but I, I'm not really a writer. He said, well, people won't care because they, they, they love wildlife stories. In this region, we go up to, we sell papers in Rockwood, all the way down to uh, Monson. He said, the people in town, they want to read the papers. So we'd like to have something in about wildlife. He said, well, let me give it a a couple of weeks, if you don't like it, I'm uncomfortable with it, or more importantly, if the readers don't like it, I won't write it. So I started writing columns you know, for the Moosehead Messenger. He said, I'll pay you $25 a week. <laughs> so make a long story short, Kent Ward, I don't know if you remember that name, Bangor Daily News, the old dog, I think was he called himself. He happened to be in Greenville, and his journalist report is, no, he, he picked up the local paper and he read one of my columns. So he called Everett and said, would you mind if I reprint this in the Bangor Daily News? And it was a story I wrote about Memorial Day Parade in Shirley. Because it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek piece. Because we we had to wait until 11 o'clock in the morning to have our parade because we borrowed Greenville High School's marching band. <laughs> so we didn't have a band. So they had to do theirs first and then they sent the band out. So I wrote a, a very funny piece about that. And uh, he read it. He, he liked it. He was, and so ever said, well, you got to call Ron. It's okay with us. But I said, I don't. I said, I'd be honest. Well, we'll pay you $35. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm getting $60 for you know, 800 word piece, which I thought, Jesus, that's pretty good money. And then we developed a rapport with, I developed a rapport with Kent Ward, and he kept getting the use of messaging, and he kept reprinting stuff. And then I wrote a piece about old growth forests. And that's, a, that's kind of a swear word with, with foresters. They want it to be called late successional. <laughs> they want the term old growth. But I wrote a piece about this uh, old growth stand, the cedar, uh, up near Allen Pond. It was in the Bangor Daily News. And then Down East Magazine read it. So they called the Bangor Daily News to get a hold of me. And they, they had a, in the magazine, they had a piece that was called The Last Page. No, it doesn't even exist anymore. But um, they had a picture of, they actually, was in, I wrote the piece about cedars, and they had this big, tall, light pine. Oh, no. <laughs> side the point. And then they asked for some more stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write. I better, I better take a writing class. <laughs> so I, I ended up asking my, a writing coach, uh, Kristen Lindquist. She's a, a, a poet, and her husband is Paul Dwarren, author of the uh, Mike Bowditch Game Warden series. Kristen, uh, I said, Kristen, if I'm gonna start writing for magazines, I, I, I need to up my game. I said, where, where would you recommend I go to a writing school? She said, well, two come to mind. Middlebury, <coughs> the summer writing school, Middlebury College, where she went to. She said, oh, the Iowa Writers Conference. So I said, well, I've never been to Iowa. <laughs> I had driven through it, you know. So I went to an Iowa Writing School, and I was there for I mean, a week or so. I learned how to fine tune when I was writing. And then, because uh, she was my my writing coach, and she, she would, she's been telling me for a long, for years, that you really should pull up all your pieces and put them in a book. I said, I don't have a book. And her husband said, her husband was, she was handing some of the pieces to her husband. And she said, he said, yeah, you have a book here. So I said, I, I, I resisted for about a year. I said, well, those stories in the book, they're not, 
the chapters, they don't follow one after another. They're just a collection of stories. So I said, nope, no publisher's going to be interested. No, oh, yeah, eh, well. <laughs> so she helped, put, helped me put it in a manuscript form. And, and Paul says, perfect place. We're going to send it to Island Port Press. He says, that's we. They, they specialize in main stories. They're in Yarmouth. Well, all I can say is no. So I sent it in, and they said, "No, we want to, we want to go with it." So that's that's how that got started. But I, you know, I, I got, some, I got some. It just came out, and some of you didn't hear. Brian Campbell was in. He said, "There's a few mistakes in the book," and I, I had noticed one in one of the copies. It's just a double page print. So, um, so if you. If you happen to get the book, and there's, it's the first printing, so there's, there are some mistakes. But I begin the book talking about really spending time on my grandparents' dairy farm because it was so important to me when I was a child. And I didn't realize until I got older what, what influence it had on my decision to become a mama. My parents didn't have much money. We never went on vacations, and so school vacations. And weekends, in the summertime, we, we, my twin brother and I, here we are, I mean, five, six, seven, eight years old. We want to be at the farm. My grandfather had workhorses. They had dairy cows, they had chickens and roosters and sheep. So this is a habit to go up there and, and spend as much time there as we could. And they didn't have any, they didn't have no indoor plumbing until 1972. No electricity until I think probably the mid 60s, late 60s. I remember when they got it, they got, somebody donated the black and white TV and they watched the Lawrence Welk show. Yeah. <laughs> they loved, my grandfather loved the Andrew sisters. I can still I can still see him in his recliner and he's got his brass spittoon. In the spittoon. <laughs> but he loved he loved the Andrew sisters. So they they watched they watched. But most of the time before they had electricity, we'd sit on the porch. And eat. It just you know, it was it was heavenly. It was just you know, it was, it was looking back, it was just magic. So I, a lot of the stories, the beginning stories about about the Yetton farm, the grandparents' farm, and what it meant to me. And there's this piece here I wrote about the drunken rooster. I don't know if you knew this, but if birds eat fermented fruit, they can get drunk. I've seen it. I've seen it several times. Have you seen it, Lindsay? Yeah. 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 Um, so we had a rooster that was drunk. And my grandmother was. Uh, <coughs> how do I say this? Addicted. I have to She was an old, crusty Yankee. Had a hard life, God fearing, and just the opposite of my grandfather. He had a good sense of humor. My grandmother really cracked a smile. So. She was appalled by this rooster <laughs> being drunk because uh, uh, his name was, uh, well, she, she replaced him. His name was Rufus. But let me read just a, just a little bit. Here. Big Red, and he's the rooster that replaced, him, replaced Rufus. Big Red, Lou grumbled. That was my grandmother, grandmother. Lucille, we called him Lou. I mean, Lou. Big Red. Lou Grimble wasn't much of an improvement over Rufus, an old rooster whose habitual drunkenness led to his tragic death earlier that year. On Easter Sunday, 1960, I was, I was eight. Rufus, who became tipsy sampling shriveled, fermented concrete grapes clinging to the arbor, shirked his duty guarding a dozen barnyard hens. By week's end, he was an alcoholic. <laughs> An unpardonable sin to my 70-year-old grandmother who believed prohibition should never have ended. Her chronic blood pressure, high blood pressure, skyrocketed when Rufus's slurred vision, uh, vocalizations and staggered gait greeted dairy customers. He would, I, because she had a, uh, she had the old oak ice box. Because my grandpa, when he harvested ice in the winter, he had an ice house, and she had an oak the old ice box at the end of the drive self service and she had cream in there and homemade butter. Her butter was her butter was really excellent. In fact she won so many blue ribbons at the Skywagon State Fair that the that the Grange told her, 
don't submit anything next year because nobody else gets a chance to win. <laughs> so she was really insulted. And she never, ever su submitted uh, her butter to the Scouting and State Fair. Again. She, she was, her butter was really good. And it won blue ribbon the year after year. But anyway, so she had, she had, she had dairy products in the ice box at the end of the driveway itself. So, so by weeks later, so her, uh, people would come in and as Rufus, he just, <laughs> and he'd be staggering down, and of course, people thought it was hysterical. So word spread that if you want to see a drunk rooster, go to the end farm. And we had this operator, because they had a party line. It says, uh, so my mother offered to find a new home for Rufus. No, Grammy snapped. He's eaten nearly all the grapes. When they're gone, maybe he'll sober up and make something of himself. <laughs> when reports of Rufus's bouts of intoxication appeared in the local newspaper, B, as Beatrice, she was the mob bell operator, and prolific gossiper, <coughs> provided curiosity seekers with directions to our farm. Grandpa joked, because all these people had started showing up. That business was hopping from the ground. Grandpa joked that my brother and I should capitalize on the publicity by erecting a roadside sign. See a drunk rooster for 10 cents. <laughs> Special family rights, 25 cents. Uh, and we thought it was terrible. My grandmother no, had no humor at all. Seeing that. A week later, when a second newspaper reporter called and interrupted our supper, my grandmother erupted. No, you can't see the rooster because he's dead. She barked into the mouthpiece. <laughs> Now you listen to me, young man. That drunk rooster done got himself killed by a fox. Serves him right. Seizing the moment to again espouse the evils of alcohol, she unloaded, quote, Now let that be a lesson to your readers. Booze leads to nothing but trouble. <laughs> Grandpa, who was known to stash a jug of old crow whiskey in the spider-infested springhouse where my grandma would never go, winked at my brother and me, he said, finish your chowder, boys, and help me put the chickens to bed. <laughs> so, so, yeah, she was pretty upset about, <laughs> about the drunk rooster. And then I go on and talk about my grandfather. Who had just, he was just the opposite of my grandma. He just had this mild temper. He, he was illiterate. Um, he was born in 1894. Um, oldest of, I think, 11 children. And back then, you're on a farm, you, the oldest you just you need, you need help on the farm. So he, he got minimal or no education. But I know he couldn't, he couldn't read or write. But his forte was horses. He had a gift. I often say now, in hindsight, he was probably the horse whisperer before the term was even. Because people from all around would bring their traumatized horses to him. And sometimes he, I mean, he, had, he had a way about him. I don't know what it was, just a gentle nature about him. And I can remember Ralph, Ralph and Albert True, who had a farm near ours, they had work horses that they used for logging because they had a big wood log. And he had a barn fire, and the horses just, you know, were traumatized by the barn fire. And Ralph was going to shoot the horse, but his brother Albert said, We'll take it to flooring, take the horses to flooring, and he, maybe he can do something. So they, I remember they came up in this big Mack truck. My brother and I, probably in 1960, eight years old, nine years old, we were just dumping wheelbarrows full of manure on the back of the barn, and here comes this big Mack truck with these blindfolded, beautiful chestnut Belgian Norton horses. And they led them over to the two-acre paddock and turned, took, the blind, took the blinders off, and they just thundered across. And then for two weeks, my grandfather just worked with one and the other with our, our or his horse, Tony, who was just laid back, really laid back, uh, the poor horse. And he, he got him straightened out. And then they came and picked up the horses. So that, that's, a, that's a new piece, too. So the farm, the farm <coughs> was uh, really instrumental in, in my development. And then, let's then I then I got a job. Let me think here. Oh, so I got a job working for. Uh, <coughs> well, I went to 
University of New Hampshire for my undergraduate. And I didn't have to study. And, um, I was on probation. I think my, they told me at the end of my freshman year if I didn't pick up the grades, I was going to talk out. So they had me on probation in my sophomore year, first, first semester sophomore year. I, I was just, I wasn't a drinker so much. Uh, I was more of a socializer. It just, <laughs> and in college, there's no teachers telling you, you know, you get a buckle down. You either do it or you don't. So I, I was on probation, pretty ready, close to flunking out. And I ended up taking ornithology my second semester. And I, and I attribute finishing college to this doctor professor, Dr. Boro, the, the ornithology. I got an A in his class, and that was a spark I needed in the second semester to keep, to keep me going. So I found my passion, and he, he honored me by making me his teaching assistant, which is usually reserved for graduate students. So I was, his, I was teaching assistant for the last few years. But he was, he was just a fabulous mentor. He took an interest in me. He could see I had an aptitude in birds and interest in me. He fostered it, and if it wasn't for him, who knows how my career would have turned out, my life would have turned out. So then when I graduated, um, I, my father and mother didn't have a checkbook or a credit card. Well, there were nobody had credit cards back then. And, but my father believed cash from the barrel. If you didn't have the money, you don't buy something. So at an early age, debt was a really bad, bad thing. So I, uh, bless my parents, we had, had three kids in college at once. And then my, parents, my parents said, well, you've got to help us help you by getting jobs. So we worked hard all summer uh, all, and could work in construction and to make money to pay college. And uh, geez, it was, a, you know, it, was, it was tough, but we, we did okay. And then after, after college, I had $1,200 in student national defense loan. And if I was teaching, I didn't have to pay it back. Well, I didn't want to carry debt because my parents didn't carry debt. So I had a $1,200 loan when I graduated from UNH. So I got a job teaching in Oakland, Maine, eighth grade science. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy, I, my, I, I tip my hat to teachers today. It was hard. But I paid my, I paid my loan off. And then I went to school at BYU, Brigham Young University. Because Bora sat me down, Dr. Bora, my senior, and he says, Well, what do you want? To, you should really, have you thought about basketball? I said, Well, oh. <coughs> he says, well you like birds. What, kind of, what do you want to do? I said, Well, if I go to study anything, I want to study raptors. He says, Well, you got two choices Cornell University, upstate New York, lab of ornithology. They got a really good program. He said, and BYU, out west. There's two professors that are really well known. Well, I'd never been out west. I mean, they'd never been west in New York State. So I decided to go up to Utah, where I got my master's degree. And then, but I was homesick. I really wanted to get back to Maine. So I got back to Maine in 78. And Lindsay will laugh at this, because you know, it's hard to get into the profession. I was living in Lewiston in an apartment. And there was a job posting. I heard of the job opening for Maine Fish and Wildlife to do deer yard work. And I applied for the job, went to Augusta, and uh, Kevin Stevens interviewed me. Uh, who else is there? Bob Bocker. Oh, remember that name? Yeah, yeah. Bob Bocker. So there was quite a few applicants like me, young applicants, who would you know, want to be biologists, applied for the job. I went through the interview process and I was I was this third selection, but these other two guys, I heard heard this later from Kevin. There was a map in the conference room where the interviews were held. It was a map of Maine, and they said, "Well, we're going to." These two guys said, "We're, we're going to send you up to Asher." I said, "Where's Asher?" Put it on the map. Said, "We're not going to Ashland." Heck, I jumped on. Of course, I'm going to Asher. It's a foot in the door. You know, it was probably the best decision I ever made. So I ended up in Ashland. Kevin Stevens was the regional biologist there at the time. Bill Noble was the assistant. 
Pearlie Easton was there. These oh, are all yeah, names yeah. that Lindsay remembers. So in 1978, I, I show up in Ashland. I didn't even have a car. My mother let me borrow, you might, you might remember these AMC cars that just looked like an egg. What the heck is this? You remember what kind of car that was? I, it was, I mean, the warrant, I pulled in the warrant, it was just like, like laughing at me. It was this squat little egg shape. It was all glass. It was just, so I ended up, my mother let me borrow a car. And I couldn't get home that following weekend because it was a snow storm. But anyway, I get, the, I get there, and Kevin Stevens says, he gave me an orientation for a day and showed me how to use the snowmobile on a bunch of maps, make sure I knew how to work, work the maps. And then he gave me a bunch of topo sheets, snowmobile, snowshoes, and sent me west to Clayton Lake. He said, I made arrangements for you to stay at Clayton Lake. That was heaven. Have you ever been to Clayton Lake when it was run by International Paper Company? Jeez, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was great. Did you, did you go there one yeah. was Yeah. Bill Sylvester was the, he's, he's retired, he lives in Auburn, he was the supervisor. But all the loggers were French Canadian. And I slept upstairs in the bunk room with the, with the French Canadian loggers. And it was hysterical. You know, was, I talk about this in the book, I make fun of them because they took, you know, uh, I remember one guy saying to his buddy downstairs, he's getting ready for dinner, so, uh, Toss me down the stairs my slippers. <laughs> and they would practice their English on me. I would correct them. And then I would try to you know, reciprocate by practicing French with them. But it was, it was, uh, I didn't want to leave. When April came, I did not want to leave. It was, I averaged five to ten miles a day on snowshoes. This is when there was big woods. You know, the budworm epidemic had just started. And they really hadn't had the big salvage cuts up there. And Lindsay will remember this name too, uh, Jack McPhee, oh, yeah. the warden pilot, who tragically died at the ground in 2003. In but he was a warden pilot on Eagle Lake over near Fort Kent, not the Eagle Lake. Over there. And I would call him and say, we had a radio <coughs> phone here at, at headquarters at, at IP, and I call him and say, I want to go up and look at Big Black, Big Black River because there's a big deer here. So he'd land on his on, the, on his skis on the on the lake and take me up. And Jack was great. And Lindy's phone with him, everybody's phone. He he was a unique warden, in my opinion, in that he was as interested in wildlife as he was in law enforcement. He was really inquisitive. And there's a wonderful piece in the New Yorker written by John McPhee about Jack McPhee, the warden. He always wanted to meet the, the, the famous game warden. So I would highly recommend that you Google that and read it. It's a beautiful, have you read it, Lindsay? No. It's a no, beautiful no, piece on Jack McPhee, uh, written by John McPhee, a famous writer. And, but I got to know Jack really well. And like I said, I, I just, I loved it. But then it, April came, and the snows, it was a sh relatively short winter for an old Maine, and the snows dissipated, and the deer, vanished out of the deer yard. I just left the deer yard. So my work pretty much ended. So then they sent, Kevin said to me, well, Augusta wants you. For, they, can, they can hire you for a couple months. So I ended up going from Ashland to the regional uh, biologist office in Augusta, who was run by Gary Donovan at the time, and Gene Dumont. It was on Federal Street. Now it's, in, now it's in the city. So I showed up. Never met Gene before. And Gene has a keen, keen sense of humor, as Lindsay knows. He's a real practical jokester. Well, his fresh bait, I come in. Gene says, you ever count deer dung? No. He says, well, we're going to be counting deer dung. He says, we've got these transect surveys, and we're going to walk a mile transect, and every 100 feet, we got to throw out, I think it was like a hula hoop-like object. I don't know if you did those transects. I did. Yeah. Yeah, a long time ago. And we're not very popular. No. <laughs> just, so Bangor, the research division in Bangor, set these random transects up and sent them out to the regional offices. So we had quite a few. So Gene gave me one day of orientation. So he says, let's go out back. He says, well, this is the first day. We'll do some training. 
to out back of the office, and there's an you know, urban forest, and he's showing me these deer and droppings. And uh, so this is what we're counting. We're not counting the individual deer droppings. We're counting the pellet groups. Is that, and these are the data sheets. This is how you fill it out. So I go another 100 feet or so, and, and there's these bright, shiny ones on the ground in the snow. Because you know, it was a little bit of snow left. He said, these are fresh. So Gene, being Gene, I didn't know him at the time. He picks them up, he sniffs them. Yeah, these are real fresh. See how, see how they so shiny they are? Then he pops one in his mouth. <laughs> and I'm aghast. <laughs> they were chocolate covered raisins. He planted about 20 minutes earlier. He said, this is a, he said, these aren't gear drops. He said, the moral of the story is everything you see is not a gear drop. So it could be sheep, we're going to run into sheep, or we're going to run into uh, snowshoe hair and goats. So he says, just don't assume that. It's <laughs> but that was, that was the beginning of my friendship with Gene. So then he takes me out to Jefferson, which is just south of Augusta. I got my own transit. Very first transit of my own. Opal sheep. <clears throat> I got a compass bearing. I got to stay on a compass bearing. And Gene's instructions were. Whatever you do, don't deviate from the compass bearing because it will throw a wrench in the statistical analysis. So Gene's over in another town doing another transect. He said, I'll pick you up. He said, we'll pick your car at the end of the mile long transect and, and I'll meet you there. Just wait for me when you get no, okay. okay. So I got my, my map, my topo sheet is 1958. So this is 1978. So a lot of land use changes in 20 years. There's clearings. On the green on the map is where forests are, but there's a lot of clearings. Well, partway through this transect, and uh, I can hear music. And there's an opening, there's a house, and there's a woman about my age, 20 something, 20, how old was I? 26 years old. She's sunbathing nude in the back of her yard because it was a beautiful, warm day. So I retreat about 100 feet, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get. You know, if she no sees me, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. So I'm hiding behind a big oak tree, out of view, and I think, how am I gonna, how am I gonna, how am I gonna handle this? Because first thing we do is field work. You know, you throw. And Lindsay knows this better as well as I do. You can throw a lot of stuff out. You gotta, you gotta improvise. <laughs> Things go wrong. So I said, can I tiptoe past her? Nope. Even though she was. We had a radio blaring. And the irony is on the song of the radio, one of the songs on the radio was Paul McCartney's new song, uh, With a Little Luck We Could Make This Whole Thing Work Out. <laughs> I think how ironic this song is. It, I'm going to need more luck to get this to work out. So I said, no, I can't tiptoe past her. And I can't just be around her because that will throw a wrench in the statistics. So I yelled to Jean as loud as I could, hoping it would just get her attention. And it did. She jumped up and ran into the house. <coughs> so then I, I step I come up like I'm and it of course it's going right through her backyard where she has been sunbathing. And there's the Jaws poster towel. And it's all crumpled up because she get up in a hurry and that shark's eyes just staring <laughs> at me in the back of, and I did not dare look at the house. So she's a, I could see her, my peripheral vision upstairs, look, staring down at me. You know, kind of thinking, oh, God, just keep going, keep going. So I, I crested a hill, and there was a barbed wire fence in the road, and I was, I was relieved until I got to the road, and there's a sheriff. <laughs> she called the sheriff. So I ducked underneath the fence, barbed wire fence. And I said, I was never more thankful in my life to have a fish and wildlife patch on my shirt. <laughs> I said, I can explain what happened. I, I knew she called him. He says, I'm all ears. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm showing him my dear dying data sheets. I'm thinking, where's Gene? You know, he could back me up. Gene wasn't there yet. <clears throat> so I'm showing him my dear dying data sheets. And he's kind of buying it. And he says, what's your name and number? And he wrote it down. Where do you work? Got my phone number for it. He says, OK, well, I'm going to go see the woman now. Uh, is there anything you want me to say to her? I said, yeah, please apologize. I said, I didn't mean to start with her, but her house isn't on my 20-year-old map. I had no idea. And I couldn't deviate from my thing. 
So nothing, thankfully, nothing became of that. But I, I, I remember doing another transit. This is pretty funny because Gene said to me, uh, when you do these transects, you're going to run into people. Because uh, this is, you know, it's, it's rural, but there's a lot of farms on it. So, so if they ask you what you're doing, just tell them you're doing wildlife surveys. Don't say you're counting deer down. <laughs> <laughs> so I, for the most part, I did. But one day I slipped. And it was a sheep farmer. I can still picture her. And here I'm walking across the pasture. She's comes over to me like, who the hell are you? What are you doing? And she says, what are you, what are you doing? I mean, it didn't even, it didn't ever occur to us to ask for permission. <laughs> so I said, I just blurted out, I'm counting deer down. <laughs> she looks at me and she says, so you went to college for that? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a story in here about deer down. Yeah, my, my experience with Dumont. Yeah, he was he was a riot. And then I had that job for about two months, April and May, and then June I was gonna be unemployed. And then Don Mayers, I don't know if I remember Don. He was really good friends with uh, Gary Donovan and Gene Dumont. And he came over for lunch once a week. And Don Mayers said to me he worked he was an entomologist for the state of he brought his lunch over and says, "So, Ron, what are you going to do now?" I said, "I don't, I really, I don't have any plan." He said, "Well, I heard Frank Grandma, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, kind of needs a, needs an eagle helper. He's been he's been tracking eagles and he, he needs some help. He had a, somebody hired, but he had hired uh, Linda Alberson from Seven Arrows, but then she got a job up in Athens, so she bailed out on him. And he needed somebody fast, so I applied for the job and I got it." And Frank, did you meet Frank? Did you know him? He was ex-Marine. Well, I guess there's no such thing as an ex-Marine. Once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine. He had a crew cut, very conservative, very straightforward charger. Frank, Frank was great. And I remember one day, there were probably, at that time, 78, somewhere between 20 and 30 pairs of eagles in Maine, and most of them were on the coast. So Frank was... He was sort of the grandfather of the Bald Eagle Restoration Program in Maine. And Bucky Owen had just took on Charlie Todd as a grad student. And I'll never forget this. Frank said, well, we're going to get in the car and drive up see meet Bucky Owen's new grad student at New Maine. He had met him uh, before. He had met Charlie before. And he said, he's a long-haired, ponytailed hippie. But I think he'll be okay. So I drove up. Charlie Ty, who was, you know, arguably you know, probably the best eagle biologist in this country. He's retired now. He had this, I don't know if you knew him, Lindsay, back I didn't then. Know him, he had a ponytail down. halfway down his back. It was it was hysterical. So I met I met him and I they were just the polar opposites of each other, these two guys. There was a chapter in here called Eagle Freaks. And uh, I worked with Charlie. And one of the things that Charlie was one of the nicest guys you could ever imagine. And in '85, I was in the I was working at, at the hatchery. Charlie called me up and said, Ron, he was running a, he and Mark McCullough were running a feeding station down east. And Charlie says, Can you do me a favor? I said, What do you need, Charlie? says, Can you go down to Belfast and pick up? I mean, there were five, <coughs> 55 gallon drums of dead chickens, frozen chickens. This is the middle of the night. Because they were putting these chickens out in, uh, at these feeding stations for eagles. Because it had been shown in Sweden that you could Im improve survival rates for juveniles in the wintertime if you could get them through the winter. Because they have a pretty high, eagles have a pretty high mortality rate that first year. So, Mark. And Charlie, how many they have like eight feeding stations or something? Lindsay, do you remember that? I don't. They had quite a few. That yeah, there were quite a few feeding stations around the state, which means they had to get a lot of food. But back then, there were a lot of chicken farms, and they were happy to donate. <coughs> so I had an old Ford truck, and I'm chugging down Route One, feathers flying everywhere, <laughs> <laughs> and I pull into Whiting, way down east, where, where I met Charlie and Mark McCollum. Mark was a grad student. 
to look at these barrels of frozen chickens that we put out. <coughs> and uh, when I, was, I spent the night, Charlie took off, but I spent the night knocking at a trailer. And I spent the night, and Mark says, uh, you know, you hear what happened today? I said, no, Charlie didn't tell me to. He said, well, this couple, these farmers, they had an old arthritic horse that they, they, was, they were going to have put down. So they thought it would be better to donate it for eagle food than just to you know, bury it. So Mark said, they brought the horse to him, all teary-eyed, and said, well, we'd rather it go to a higher cause. And so they left. And Mark's helpers dispatched the horse with a you know, shot to the head. He said, 20 minutes later, they come, here comes the truck. They're, they're coming back. But Mark says, my, my helpers are running out to stop him. You know, we can't see old Charlie now because he's dead. So as it turns out, I said, oh, I hope they didn't have a change of heart. No, nope, she just wanted the harness or something, something off as a keepsake. <laughs> but, and now we've got. I don't know, close to, I think, that's when I heard seven, eight hundred pairs yeah, of yeah, this yeah. thing. And he, they're everywhere now. Yeah. <laughs> so the chapter in there on, on that, it's called Legal Freaks. Uh, but I remember Frank had me write letters to Lando. My job was primarily to figure out who owned the couple dozen eagle nests left and write write to the owners and ask them if they would voluntarily protect the eagles. Frank wasn't big on regulations. He thought that was too heavy to handle. And I, I remember there was a nest on Bartlett Island off MDI. It was owned by David Rockefeller, the Rockefellers. So I, I, I can remember finding out about the nest along the island through town tax maps. And I wrote a letter to David Rockefeller, one Rockefeller Plaza in New York, New York. <laughs> <laughs> Sent it off, and never thought I'd hear from him again. Like three weeks later, I get a letter. to Ron Joseph, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the guest of Maine, you know, David Rockefeller returned to us. And it was very brief. He said, Ron would be happy to sign the voluntary agreement. Here it is. And we love eagles, and we'll do everything we can to protect them and keep us posted on the project. And then years later, many years later, I met him at a Friends of Acadia uh, uh, gathering, and he was there. And he said, your name's familiar. And I said, well, I reminded him about this. He said, oh, yeah, now I remember. He said, yeah. he said, the Eagles are doing a lot better now, aren't they? After they are. And I was sad to see that he died just a few years ago. But you never know who you're going to you're gonna run into or what you're going to. But that was, a, that, was a, that was a fun project. And then uh, one I wanted to um, read was the Orphan Bear Cut, just parts of it. What time we got? Yeah, we're getting close. I want to leave some time for some questions. Um, this is the Orphan Bear Cut. I was in Greenville at this time, 1988. Retirement for many Maine couples means time to travel the backwoods and back roads of the state of Maine to camp, hike, and observe wildlife. Retired dairy farmers Ruth and Martin French of Dover Foxgrove certainly enjoyed seeing wildlife, but they didn't travel far afield. The animals came to them. For 50 years, injured wildlife from fawns and flying squirrels to the occasional skunk arrived at the French farm in shoe boxes, onion bags, and wrapped in blankets. Martin at the time was the dean of Maine's wildlife rehabilitators. Ruth, his able bodied assistant. Um, I can remember he told me, he said, I tell these animals when they come in, if you want to fight for your life, and he lectured every animal, I promise to fight 10 times harder to ensure you get a second chance at it. So I met Martin in 1988, and it was, uh, it was uh, kind of a sad occasion because, uh, not, not meeting Martin, but the circumstances. I remember being in the office in Greenville, it was probably early March, and this woman pulled into the parking lot of our office. And she got out and she had a blanket. And she came in, she was crying. And I said, what's the matter? She said, well, we've got this bear cut. My husband's a log. And he's cutting wood over towards Rockwood. And 
he backed his skitter up onto a bear's den and killed the sow and a cop. Plus his 14,000 pound skitter, his big skitter. And he didn't know it because he was loud. Um, so he shut the skitter off and went back the next morning. He decided he could hear a baby crying. So he got digging through the brush pile and realized it wasn't a brush pile, it was a den. So he called his wife, went into Rockwood, called his wife, Rockwood, called his wife, and she came and got the bed out. And then she tried to nurse it that night and realized this thing was you know, So she brought it to me. And I called Martin, French, good Martin. You ever dealt with bear cubs? She said, yep, right now he's still pretty tough. So I brought the bear cub down and uh, he said, I'll let you know in about a week how it's, it's going to make it. And he, and he had this, he has an old farm, I remember it was uh, dairy or cow stalls, he would repurpose them to wildlife. He had raccoons there and I don't know what other critters. But he took the bear cubs, he said, I've handled a few bear cubs, he said, they're, they're, they're hard, they're tough. So he started feeding goat's milk. He said, we don't want to feed them cow's milk. I didn't know this. He said, goat's milk is much better for so I called him a week later. He says, "Yep." He says, "I bet that bear cub eating dog." He says, uh, "He's like a toddler up in a high chair." He says, "He just grabs a bowl and <laughs> pours it in." He says, "He's gaining weight. He's doing real well." So great. So a week goes by. He called me. I didn't call him. He called me. He says, "You got to come get this guy." <laughs> he says, it's a, "It was a she." It turns out. He says, "You got to come get her." He says. I can't keep her. She's just, she's gotten so strong, she's put so much weight on. He says, you got to find a place, like Sal, that will take her. So I call him Randy. And Randy said, well, most Sal's want to adopt. Lindsay knows it better than I do. Most Sal's want to adopt. But Randy had one, I think it was up near with Rage. He had, she would, he, he had luck before uh, giving her a so we took it up there, and he told me this. I, I'll never forget this. And he said, "Don't wear Gore-Tex pants and don't wear metal snowshoes." <laughs> he was adamant about that. It makes too much noise, so they can hear. So, and I stayed back, and Randy knew it because it, it was a radio call in South, so he knew he knew where she was. And uh, he, he dropped her in, in the, in the den. She just—he said she just grabbed the cover and pulled it under her chin. And then he said he went back weeks later to see how it was doing. Because the cub had really kind of unique markings. Uh, some bears have a little white on the chest. And this, it turns out it was a female. She had, she had white on the back of her neck. Like, like she bumped into a wet paint. Or something. And Randy said, oh no, they were, they were, with her adopted siblings, they were playing tug of war with a deer female or something like that. So, <laughs> so I said, no, it, it, it worked out okay. But that's what the, the book is about. It's about my story growing up in the farm and, and uh, my career. So let me open up to questions. We've got a few minutes left. I probably talked way too much. <laughs> and, any burning questions? I had a question last night that was kind of threw me for a loop. Gordon Russell, he said, what was your most harrowing experience in, as a wildlife biologist? I said, well, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that, but I got to think about it. It wasn't really with wildlife, but it was up at Clayton Lake um, in 1978, probably in late January. I had never seen Aurora Borealis, and it was just spectacular that evening. And the French-Canadian lumberjacks, they like it hot in the bug house. And it was 19 below zero outside, but it was 82 in the bunker. <laughs> the, the wood, yeah, I think I can still picture it was an old, uh, I call it a bulldog stove. They made them for a schoolhouse, schoolhouse stove. It was pink. I mean, it was, they kept feeding the <laughs> thing. It was, it was stifling in the bunk house. So I said, I had to get some. So I went outside, all dressed up, I had snowshoes, and I said, well, I'm going to walk across the lake. And look at, watch the undulating ribbons of yellow and blue and, and, and reds. It was spectacular. 
And I lost track of where I was. I was just walking, and I was actually, without knowing, I was walking towards that one, which is, I've been told, you know, drummed into my head as a kid because I grew up in the Belgrade Lake. Don't go anywhere near the outlet. Even in the winter, because you know, the current picks up and it's thin. Well, before I knew it, my right, my right foot, snowshoe, went through the ice. And I could not feel the bottom. Thank goodness my left snowshoe stayed up. But now I got a hole in the ice, and all this collapsed column of ice is on top of my snowshoe, and I can't look at the foot. And I can't feel the bottom, so I can't push myself up. And it's cold. And I think, I can't, and I, I'm holding on to the leg ice, and my legs, my left leg's getting tired. If it, and I said, I got to think quickly. You know, you, got, you don't have much time. <clears throat> and I remembered I had a Swiss army knife in my right wool pants <coughs> pocket. And I, I, I reached into the water, took my mitten off with my teeth, and threw it up on the ice. And I reached in my pocket, grabbed my knife, and I opened up with my teeth, and I said, I got a cup of harness. And I'm shivering, and I reached in, and I, I did it. I, I said, I'm not going to have any chances, because I'm going to, it's going to be hypothermic for a while. So I cut the harness, and uh, grabbed the tail of the snowshoe, and brought it up, and it just collapsed on the ice. And then, and it's kind of fuzzy from that point on because I, I was definitely early stages of hypothermia because your brain plays all kinds of tricks. And my brain was saying to me, rest, because I was exhausted from trying to get out. And the other brain he said, no, no, we got to get moving, get moving, I'm part of my brain. And from there on, I, I don't remember a whole lot other than I was stuck to the ice because I'd been splashing. <laughs> So there's now water that was on top of the snow that had frozen. And when I came out, when I got myself out, my pants froze. They were wet. They froze to the ice. So I'm going to cut a layer off my wool pants so I can stand up. And they they felt <coughs> like boards, my, my pants, all wet. And I just, I don't remember, but I just, how I got back. But I got back. And <coughs> I got, got to bed. And there was a... Uh, he, I took a liking to this guy. His name was, his last name was Desjardins. I don't remember his first name. But he saw me. He got there in the night, probably to pee, I'm guessing. And he saw all my wet clothes and, on the floor. And he figured it out what could happen. And he hung them up that night. He pulled my packs out of my, my Sorrel boots and put them up on the wood box. And then in the morning, I mean, I was embarrassed and ashamed of myself for put myself in that situation. So I, I didn't say anything to anybody, and, uh, but he knew it. And I can remember at the dinner breakfast table, he put his arm around me and he said, you, you've done good to oh. And I know he meant, yeah. get, get yourself out. That, that, was, that was probably the most terrible <laughs> experience <laughs> I had. And the other time, too, I was doing breeding bird point counts for Jerry Long for research biologist. Used to be with Fish and Wildlife Service, and they took that division and moved it over to USGS. But Jerry asked me to do breeding bird point counts, and Judy Markowski could no longer get the birds. It was on the stud mill road, way out, and there was a spur road off the stud mill road, out in the booties, and I'm in this sapling stand. It had been cut like 15 years earlier. Always hardwood saplings, real thick. And there's a pack of coyotes showed up. And they were, there was seven or eight of them. They were, they were running circles around me. They probably thought I was a deer. I'm making noise. And I, I, it was, I wouldn't say I was afraid, but I, it was unsettling. I, could, I said to myself, well, if they really wanted to take me down, they could take me down. Because I had no tree to climb. But they did. They just ran around me a couple times. It was so thick I could see their feet and catch glimpses of them, but I couldn't see them. But I knew they were coyotes. And I said, boy, yeah. They came to see if it was a deer. And they're, they're sizing me up if I was a deer. But they took off. But I was, 
Yeah, it was a little, <laughs> yeah, a little, a little unsettled feeling. That's all. But I like Kyle, so don't, don't, you know, I don't want to leave you with it personally. Don't like Kyle. That was, that was a question I didn't anticipate. Yeah. Yeah. It's just no shoe incident. That's in the, that's in the book. So I love, I love that. Yeah, I, I just, I was pretty lucky. You know, I grew up in Maine and. And get a career as a wildlife biologist here. Yeah. Still pull up. And I was at right time, because now it's all computer driven. As you know, that's what drew me, that's what pushed me out. I just, I spent more time in front of the computer than I was doing field work. You know, it was, it was a, so I retired in 2010. Kyle, what do you wish you had stayed a little longer? But I was eligible. And don't want to, I don't want to be a computer like an armchair biologist. <coughs> I don't want to be an armchair biologist. So I, I call it quits. Uh, writing stories for magazines down east from the main boats, homes, and harbors. And then during the pandemic, I had to have something, a project. And Kristen said, Finish, do that book. <laughs> <laughs> this is the culmination of it. It's seven o'clock, so I don't want to keep people any longer. Now, just say thank you for coming. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know a lot of the people I talked about. Um, I was a fraternity brother of Don's. Oh, oh, you were? Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Same class in college, and uh, Mike Roy was my roommate, so. Uh, I maybe met you once before. No, ki no kidding. Keep Tom Lazada's the name. I I'll, tell, I'll tell Don. I worked at the Morning Sentinel for 20 years. Okay. What's your name again? Tom Lazada. Okay. Oh, sure. Sure. I know. Yeah, of course. I was a sports editor at the Sentinel for Of course. I know the name. Yes. Yeah. So do you live up here now, Tom? I live there. Yeah, my wife's in Dover. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. I'm going down to. No, I've read, I've read a lot of you. Tell me tomorrow to see uh, Mike and uh, Dan Cobblesby. Oh, yeah. Well, tell Mike I said hello. Mike, great, great guy. Yeah.